Thank you for all your interest. Um, basically, what we did was we had a year ago, we issued a sort of drone machine, and uh, we had a year of feedback, do this, do that, why this, and why that. And we have decided to work on a second improved uh, drone machine with attachments. So um, I'm, going, I'm not going to make any performances, so excuse the noise that you will hear, but I am only here to demonstrate the technical side of it uh, to, to see um, uh, what it does, how you go around uh, using its facilities. It's up to the artistic uh, people amongst you to go ahead. Um, we have initially decided to bring it out again as a separate unit, which I have in front of me here. However, um, with, uh, we are aware that there is a good number and it's increasing uh, on the island of Euro accusers. So uh, quite early in the design of the second unit, we have to decide to go to make it Eurorec compatible, which have added some um, features to it, which we will discuss uh, at the appropriate time. So, uh, Terremashka. Terremashka is a Maltese from Italian of a barrel organ. Uh, a barrel organ, basically, you feed it something, which could be anything, in the case of the Terremashkas, uh, they, they would have been uh, a musical score on card or on uh, wood punched. And uh, when you turn the handle, uh, it makes music or whatever. Um, this particular one has uh, something similar to that, uh, a digital analog to loading it up uh, manually, and then you let it cycle through the same thing all over, which is why we named it Terre Mashka. Okay, um, uh, basically, we have a single, a single okay. Um, this takes, have been designed to use one of these. These are quite prolific. Nowadays, anybody who has a mobile phone has one of them. So what you do is you just plug it in, switch on, and we start hearing the melody of a single sound. Um, I would like to point out that uh, I am not using uh, the audio through the system so that we can be as close as possible to the actual experience. This will be moved at a later date. Okay, here we have a single oscillator, wow, okay. And it starts getting boring after a few seconds, okay, what to do? Uh, we can change its tone. Wow, let's look at that, okay? And you can go up into supersonics so that maybe we can sell a few to the bats which fly around at our place too. There you go. Okay. Now, since also this gets boring, okay, uh, there is also a feature that this is the fundamental frequency of the oscillator. Um, we also decided to improve in it by adding a sub-octave to it. And another division to get a sub-octave. Sub Basically, what is happening here is that we are getting the fundamental frequency dividing it by two to get a sub-octave, and dividing that a further by two to get a sub-octave. So you can blend into them. Here what I am doing basically is uh, using uh, a three-stage mixer to blend between each other uh, the three separate frequencies. Let's settle for here. Right, 
in addition to the constant tone, uh, we have added also a stutter feature. The stutter feature, as it suggests, is it switches on and off the tone uh, at a settable rate to give it some uh, motion, even if it is just a single tone. So let's kick the stutter in. That is the slowest stutter rate. Then we start increasing Put up the frequency up a bit. And we go into chip tune territory. For those who would like to push further the envelope, we have decided to increase further its range and it can scream all at once. Just a little bit to go. Let's go back to a pure tone. Okay. And we have some audio movement on the single oscillator. Now, um, at the moment I was just playing manually with the controls and uh, the changes in frequency that you have heard uh, was being made by, through my hands manually by varying the frequency knobs. Um, now, at uh, this unit, uh, we have added um, a sequencer, an eight-stage step, an eight-step sequencer, which could change the frequency by itself so that you can have a tune. If we, I have, the way it does is that rather than just have a single tuning knob to change the frequency, we have eight different tuners. This is one of them, which we can access one by one on a sequence. And we get this. What is happening here is that, as we can see by the light, uh, there is a, a clock bit generator, which is then generating a three-bit code, which is being decoded into eight steps. And each step has a potentiometer connected to it, which we can set individually to give us the tunes which you are hearing now. Uh, this has been set at a slow rate so that one can appreciate the difference between each other. But we can kick it up a bit, quite a lot actually. And again, if we push the envelope, you get a drone of a drone. We can kick stutter in.
Thanks, everybody. Please answer that phone, which seems to be ringing somewhere. <laughs> This is what I would call a linear progression of the channels. We have eight channels. We go, we start from one and we go to eight. Uh, the oscillator, the, the, the clock bit generator, uh, has the possibility that it can, go, can be run in random mode. Random mode, rather than uh, programming the generator to out be, output a, a constant adding of a number, um, we can turn that into a, something a little bit chaotic by actually bringing in three separate generators generating a single bit to make up the decoding word for the 3 to 8 the multiplexer so that it can go absolutely nuts. And we get this. Basically, um, what is happening here that the sequencer is running in a random mode. However, um, the random mode is on repeat. Once again, uh, taking into consideration the moniker of the Terremashka random on repeat. Okay, that is one mode by which this unit can be run. The second mode into which it can be driven uh, is called the wavetable oscillator mode. And please bear with me because I am going to give you a whole course on wavetable oscillators on a single page in a couple of minutes. Um, basically, a wavetable oscillator is a digital entity uh, it involves uh, a processor, a central processor, which basically what it does is it accesses a, a library of values on, fee on certain memory locations, and it uses the values which are found there to generate its uh, output wave. Uh, what the wavetable oscillator does is if we take a unit which has only eight memory locations with eight memory uh, values in each location. Um, it reads four zeros and four ones. It passes this digital information through a duck and it outputs the relevant waveform which can be processed uh, as being an audible signal rather than a digital one. Um, four zeros and four ones would, would give us a simple square wave, which has this frequency and this characteristic shape. If, on the other hand, we go down to another place in the same library, 
we have the figure from one to seven incrementing all the way into eight steps. When the duck outputs it, we see that we get a stepped uh, waveform which resembles a ramp. It is not a straight line, but because it, this is a digital thing, and unless we, un we apply anti-aliasing and other processing, uh, it would remain a stepped one. However, as you can see, it is a very good facsimile of a ramp. Uh, in order for this to happen, the processor within the digital oscillator would have to step from the first memory location to the eighth memory location to generate a single wave. So actually, we need eight clock samples to get one cycle of audible frequency. Now, basically, that is how a digital wavetable oscillator works. And here we have replicated the digital processing to obtain a wave by wavetable um, by using the eight-step sequencer. If we look here, we would find that if we set the eight frequency potentiometers on each channel to the same values that we had in the memory, the example I used before to demonstrate how the wavetable oscillator works in memory location A, we would have the four at the beginning would be set at zero volts and the remaining four set at maximum. This would give a wave which is similar to the square wave we generated with memory data located in memory location A. Consequently, if we do the same thing with the values in memory location B here, and as you can see, zero, one, two, this is increasing, three, four, we are always increasing the level of voltage to get the wave similar to this. So basically, this is a crude analog representation of what happens into an actual wavetable oscillator. And we get this kind of result. Let's move this away. We change its mode from uh, audio oscillator to CV. Okay. There you go. And we change this up. And we see, we make the run. Now, the oscillator which sets the rate at which the sequencer works is the sampling rate setting, which as we've said, every eight steps would generate a, a wave controlled by the levels placed in here. If we increase the sampling rate, we increase the frequency of the output. And as you can hear, we have quite, quite a range. Okay, just quiet it down a bit because volume control, um, now there is no volume control except from here or as for further processing in there. Um, that effect, is changed. I have just changed its frequency. The levels of voltages, I, ha I have left them the same, but now I am going to keep the frequency the same, but I'm going to change the voltage levels, the individual voltage levels of each bit 
to demonstrate the change, the subtle change in tonality of the uh, signal coming out of the oscillator in wavetable mode. So, if we go. Um, I would like to say here that um, the, no the sound that you were hearing prior to starting the demonstration, um, that was a 32-bit sound. This one is much cruder. It is only 8-bit uh, of resolution, uh, which is, as I'm sure all those who can uh, appreciate bit crush, the, the, the way bit crush destroys uh, the, the, the signal, uh, this is basically comes already destroyed. So the <laughs> basically the, 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 that's how it is. Um, right, TV mode. Okay. Um, I will now run it and on in random mode. And here what we have is when before we had an ordered reading from memory location from channel one to channel two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Now it will access these uh, in a random fashion so that the settings would no longer be applicable as I was demonstrating here that instead of we having uh, just a simple square wave, we can have a lot of uh, voltages coming in and out which would uh, be translated into a much more complex and hopefully more interesting uh, wave, sonic wave. Now we slide over to random. And as always, when I'm alone at home, I would find these sweet spots almost immediately, but during a demonstration, they are elusive. However, uh, you get the idea, and believe me, um, once you get into the groove with this unit, there is a lot of uh, depth into it. And here we are only talking about it as a single unit. Uh, we keep that in mind. Apart from being used as a single unit, as I have stated before, um, we have decided to make it compatible with Eurorack, and it, it actually fits in a Eurorack. I have the similar 
thing here installed in a Eurorack, and basically all what you all you need do to install it in here is you just remove. By the way, this works from a nine volt battery, which isn't that much of a problem to, to, to have. And if we look, all we have to do is remove the battery, take out this protective piece of foam, and voila, we have a Eurorack connector so that it can run from a Eurorack power supply. Now we put this by this side and we turn over to here. Okay. You may be wondering what were these three lights up here to doing? That is a clock divider. What is a clock divider? Basically, a clock divider is, as the name implies, it takes a clock input, which is a train of pulses, as I'm sure everybody knows, and it divides it by two to get half the frequency of the incoming clock and divides that by two further to get another division, which would be the original clock divided by four. Now here, I have bridged the divide between mentioning clock and uh, in electronic terms and uh, the time notation in music. Uh, as you can see here, if we consider a clock input as being quavers, we can consider the half frequency as being crotchets and the divide by four as being minims. Okay? So you can consider this that if you have something going on and you really would like to synchronize everything, you have those three separate but synchronized time divisions by which you can tie everything and make everything happen when they are required and not on a random uh, fashion. Um, it is important to note that the clock divider here, which outputs this, does not follow the random rule when the unit is running in random. Uh, it's a bit, okay. Um, when you run the unit in random, the clock divider re remains in linear mode. Now, why do we put a clock divider into Storbio? Because by doing so, uh, we can trigger other voices or envelope generators or other sequencers also. We, I, I can actually use the divider to run a second unit at the same speed, at half the speed or at one quarter of the speed so that we can further expand our soundscape. Now, um, uh, here, to keep everything simple, I have decided to trigger drum voices, which are here, okay? And when the divider is running, we have the clock frequency coming in, which is the hi-hat, we have half the frequency as the bass drum
and the quarter frequency as a snare, eventually. When we mix them all together, we get something like this. Okay, it looks that sounds like a funeral march, so we pick it up a bit. Um, I need to point out here, uh, just a reminder, that the voicing is not in Storbio. Storbio is just providing the triggering of the, of the voices, which are supplied separately. Okay. No. Um, so far, we have inc um, used the sequencer as a drone within itself when the unit was being used as an individual standalone um, unit. However, when we change it over to use for Eurorec, um, we are able to take a varying control voltage from each separate channel so that we control in the same uh, method that we are controlling external voices, we can control an external voltage controlled oscillator, which is what we have over here, so that we can generate uh, a sound from external oscillators. This particular oscillator has three outputs, which are uh, a ramp, a square wave, and a sine wave. And we can see, let's put this down a bit. And stop this one. And we can hear them. Hopefully. The change in tonality is the external oscillator, not the storbio. Now, this is the... I am manually adjusting one channel just to see. I, what I'm doing is I am changing the control voltage coming out of storbio and going into the VCO which when we run the sequencer, hmm, interesting.
as you can see, it has now become the actual terremashka because it can provide percussion in the voice over here. Okay. One other thing that we have included in the Terremashka is, apart from it controlling Eurorec, we can sort of make Eurorec control Storbio. And the way to do it is by providing it with an external clock input. Okay, how does this work? Uh, so far, we have used the internal clock provided in the unit, but now we are going to plug in an LFO, uh, uh, which is a low-frequency oscillator, which will supply us with the external clock input, and we can run, we can run Terremashka at the speed which we set by adjusting the LFO rather the internal oscillator. As you can see, the progression rate is being set by the LFO. Okay, so what is the big deal with controlling it from outside? Well, that is part of the creativity um, uh, capability of the unit because while the internal LF, um, oscillator is only adjustable by manually, the external one can be uh, anything, it can vary into frequency by itself. You can have another LFO controlling the clock LFO, so you can have varying frequencies or effects or soundscapes available to you. And, um, right, basically, that is the unit. However, if we have still time, do we have still time? Right, right, okay. Um, uh, there is another mode which I would like to demonstrate uh, so that we can see further use and uh, the capability of what it can do for, for, for us uh, here. Now, um, we have three clock divider channels. That means that we have only uh, the clock frequency, half its frequency, and a quarter of its frequency, as I have, I have demonstrated on, on the graph which we have here. However, there is a hidden, um, there is a hidden fourth channel here, which works by setting all the sequencer outputs to zero, and we emulate, rather than a, const a, a control voltage, we emulate a trigger pulse. Now, um, what I have done here is I have the fourth drum uh, voice, and 
I will be triggering it from the same output by which I was controlling the external VCO by feeding it a control voltage. As I have said before, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to simulate rather a trigger pulse rather than a control voltage. And the way to do that is that I would uh, remove all voltages from the eight steps and only bring up one of them, which would be the pulse that would trigger the fourth voice, which is a clap. So I will remove the CV connection from the uh, VCO and plug in the trigger CV. This is supposed to be a clap. What I'm doing here is um, I'm readjusting the voice because I was demonstrating something uh, beforehand, the demonstration, and I forgot to bring it back. Now, as you notice here, um, there is a clap on channel one. If we want to bring up any number of claps, as long as they are all turned, we can do by simply turning up the CV of the channel we want it to be. So if we have one on here on one and on three, as we can see, we have a trigger on one and the trigger on four. If we want to change the time where the clap sounds is triggered into this whole sequence, we can change them from one and four, for example, to two and five, or six, and when we go As you can see, And uh, as you can see, uh, you can change the, uh, the place of the fourth trigger uh, in relation to the whole sequence. And uh, basically, that's it. Um, I hope that um, I have been clear about its technical um, capabilities. Uh, now it is up to the um, 
you uh, inventive people to come up with the ideas on how to use it and produce some nice music or at least what I'll do, noise. Thank you, thank you.